And good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our October training. Um, today we will be talking about transportation as a social determinant of health. And we have a great um, duo of speakers lined up for you. So just as an overview of who we are, uh, Trust for America's Health is a independent nonpartisan public health prevention focused organization. Um, we are deeply committed to advancing evidence-based policy and advocacy with a focus on equity. And we believe in um, improving the health of every community and making disease prevention a national priority. We uh, produce several reports each year, um, actually not featured here is our most recent report um, on the state of obesity. So just some logistics <clears throat> as we um, begin this training, um, please keep yourself on mute during the duration of the presentation. Um, at the end, after our speakers have shared their information, there'll be an opportunity to come off mute and ask the speakers questions directly. Um, if you have any questions during the session, feel free to put them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat for these questions and we will share them at the end. So just to ground us in a little bit of um, context around transportation, I find it interesting that we talk about transportation as a social determinant of health, but transportation is also very uh, keenly interconnected with other social determinants of health. It's all very interconnected. You need transportation to get to social engagement activities. You need transportation to uh, go to the grocery store and your medical appointments. You need transportation to engage. You need transportation in your affordable housing communities. A part of having a livable community is having access to reliable and supportive transportation. So I think it's very timely that we, again, continue in our series this year and talking about transportation, but also setting the context for how interconnected it is and important it is for older adults to um, live and um, age healthy. So our speakers today, I'm excited to um, share with you all, is first um, Virginia Dyes, the Director of Transportation at US Engine and the Co-Director of the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. So she will present first. And then we will turn it over to Barbie um, McBee. She's the Program Director at Rocky Mountain Rural Health. Now, for those of you that attended our training last month, you will think that we planned this purposely, but it is, again, going back to that point about interconnectedness, this idea of rural health is becoming uh, very important, obviously, in many discussions. And so we're also excited to bring themes from our previous training back and continue that discussion as well. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Virginia to kick us off today. Uh, thanks very much, Karan. I'm really excited to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all about transportation and healthcare. Um, I work at US Aging, which um, many of you may know is the membership organization of area agencies on aging and Title VI aging services programs on um, Indian reservations around the country. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit um, about our work on transportation. Um, just so you know, US Aging standing has a longstanding commitment to transportation. Um, we um, recognize it as one of the priority areas that we work in, primarily because area agencies on aging tell us that in terms of their priorities, transportation is uh, priority one, two, or three. Um, and we know that uh, many area agencies on aging um, spend part of their um, uh, funding under the Older Americans Act to provide small transportation programs that are meant to meet the needs of their community. Uh, next slide. So this is my slide to talk about the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. Um, we have been in existence since 2016. We're funded by the Federal Transit Administration, and we are a partnership between US Aging and Easter Seals. And that partnership actually 
um, is a very long-standing partnership between our two organizations. Um, Easter Seals, many of you may know, um, has a history of serving uh, people with disabilities of all ages, including children, as well as older adults and everyone in between. Um, so we feel like our two organizations really complement uh, one another, and we both come at the need for transportation um, as, as a really important priority for both of us. Um, the mission of uh, the NADTC, and that's the acronym I'm going to use because National Aging and Disability Transportation Center is quite a mouthful, um, is to promote the availability of accessible transportation options, specifically those transportation options that meet the needs of older adults, people with disabilities, caregivers, and communities. Um, and by accessible transportation, we certainly mean wheelchair accessible transportation um, as depicted in this photograph, but we mean more than that. Um, transportation accessibility really means um, in our vernacular um, that it includes everything from being able to find out about transportation options in your community, and particularly for older adults and people with disabilities, finding transportation that meets your needs. And I'm sure that you all are aware that older adults and people with disabilities, or at least many of them, need more than just a ride that comes to their door. They may need, may need help to get out of the door, um, down the steps or down the ramp um, into a vehicle, um, they actually may need, in some cases, to have someone travel with them um, and stay with them at their destination. So transportation is a very individualized service um, and really does imply more than just having public transit um, in your community, although certainly that's a very important service. Um, we at the NADTC do a lot of technical assistance and information sharing. Our primary audience, though, is not older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers. It is those organizations, primarily in the community, but also at the state level, that provide any kind of transportation. So it includes public transit agencies as well as providers of voucher programs, uh, people who provide um, or organizations that provide volunteer transportation, um, transportation to medical services, as well as transportation to a lot of other destinations. So we, we provide technical assistance and support to those agencies that are concerned about transportation as well as organizations that advocate for transportation. And we know that that's a lot of organizations that work in healthcare. Um, we do a lot of communication and outreach. Obviously, we do training. Um, and we partner with a lot of different organizations, particularly organizations in aging, transportation, and um, uh, disability. And finally, uh, most years, we provide a small uh, community grant program that's designed to help uh, communities develop a new program or uh, develop a planning process for increasing their transportation, looking at their transportation resources, um, or improving a program that already exists. Next slide. Um, so I want to take a few minutes to talk about an initiative that we at NADTC have been involved in um, since 2020, actually. A great time to start a new initiative, right? Just at the start of the pandemic. Um, it, the timing was not great. Um, but we have a focus on serving the needs of diverse older adults, younger adults with disabilities, and caregivers. And our focus is on transportation equity, 
transportation diversity, as well as inclusion. And by inclusion, we mean engaging with older adults themselves, as well as younger adults and caregivers in planning uh, transportation that's needed at the community level. Um, this is the cover of a national survey that we conducted in partnership with VNL Research, which is an Atlanta-based uh, research firm um, in 2021. And I wanted to share just a couple of excerpts from that survey. Um, next slide. So we received between February and April of 2021, over 2000 responses. Um, we received over 1200 responses from older adults, 624 from younger adults with disabilities and 605 caregivers. Next slide. Um, so one of the primary questions that we asked was, where do you need to go? Um, what are the primary destinations that you need to go to? And we found that both younger adults with disabilities and older adults um, chose the same four primary destinations. You'll not be surprised that number one on both lists is medical and dental appointments. Um, but supermarket and going to the store is a close second, or in the case of younger adults with disabilities, um, it's, it's basically equal with getting to medical care. The third destination also is probably not surprising. When you think about the impact of social isolation that, that we have all felt since the pandemic, but that is a major health care and mental health issue for older adults and younger adults with disabilities who are often isolated in ways that most of us um, don't experience. Um, so visiting family and friends um, is a high priority and going to the pharmacy. And you'll notice that every one of these four top destinations, more than half of our respondents um, noted the need to get to these destinations. Next slide. Um, we also asked about the biggest transportation barriers for older adults. Um, and to explain this slide, so you'll notice that the gold slides, uh, the gold bars represent African Americans. Uh, the green or aqua bars are uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The red bars are Hispanic respondents, the purple bars are responses from Native Americans. And finally, I mean, just, just so you know that the responses that we got from Native Americans didn't just come from Indian reservations, but they also came from Native Americans who live in other places. Um, and finally, the other responses include um, white respondents who are themselves LGBTQ or new immigrants um, or people who, for whom English is, is a second language, as well as multiracial individuals. Um, so you'll see that not enough public transit is a big issue um, and that it's a major, major issue, um, especially for uh, Native Americans. Um, the community does not have enough or any transportation options, a big issue across the board, but especially for Native Americans and people who fall into that other category. Um, no family or friends who drive regularly. And this is a big issue for people who don't have a caregiver or in, com in a, a community where, or in a household where there is no transportation, where they may live with a daughter, but the daughter doesn't drive or doesn't have a car or can't afford very often to take their loved one to the doctor. So it's a major um, uh, expense issue as well as something that has to do with availability. 
for services. Um, and then transportation too expensive. We heard this across the board. We heard this from uh, respondents who came from rural areas, as well as people who live in urban areas and suburban areas. And one of the things that we learned um, is that there may be free or reduced fare programs, and there are of necessity in public transit. That's a requirement if you get federal dollars to support your public transit agency. But if you don't have public transit, um, that's not available. In addition, we've learned that a lot of people, even though this, are, this is available to them in their community, simply don't know about it. Um, and then, of course, uh, concerns about COVID and uh, uh, safe travel um, were, were really important issues. Next slide. So that's really all the excerpts I'm going to share from my um, from our survey, because I, I want you to have plenty of time to listen to what Barbie has to say, um, since she's got the local level um, experience. But this is my contact information, and you can find the entire report um, uh, from our national survey on our website, as well as more information about our DEI survey, as well as other resources on transportation. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, and with that, uh, I guess I'll say next slide and turn it over to Barbie. Thank you, Virginia, and, and thank you, Karen, for inviting me here today. Um, my name is Barbie. I'm with Rocky Mountain Rural Health, and we are located in Fair Play, Colorado, at just under 10,000 feet in the Colorado Rockies. It is truly beautiful here. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my organization, how we approach things in the rural health setting, and how we break down barriers that prevent access to care for our, for our population. Um, next slide, please. So in 2014, Rocky Mountain Rural Health created its community health worker model. Um, we hired locals that have lived in the community for many years, put them through training um, through the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Texas A&M Certificate Program for Community Health Workers. Um, we offer all of the services you see there on the list. Our community outreaches are the primary way we reach people in Park County. Um, we live in very rugged terrain. Driving can be hazardous. So instead of them coming to us, we go to them. At our community outreaches, we provide basic health screenings, uh, blood sugar, blood pressure, uh, the all important oxygen check at 10,000 feet. Um, we work with them. We provide health literacy information. Um, we provide navigation to needed health services here in Park County. Um, there's one family practice in the community. That's it. We don't have anything else. Um, we, we bring training and education with through our partners in advanced care planning, mental health first aid, uh, we try to offer this information to them in the hopes that they're able to apply their education in moments of crisis until help can arrive. Um, we bring the mobile mammography. I, we have way more people than I care to mention that have been diagnosed positive with breast cancer off of this program over the last 10 years. Um, we help basically with the social determinants of health. When you go to the doctor, you get your you get your results from your doc, but then there's all that ancillary stuff that happens. Why did I get overbilled? How come my deductible didn't kick in? We help sort through that. Um, as far as the Affordable Care Act, we are certified health coverage guides as prescribed by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that is supposed to be provided free in the communities uh, to help access the tax credits and the cost share reductions. Uh, we work with people to get personal uh, personal grants for stuff that um, healthcare doesn't cover, health insurance doesn't cover, hearing aids, eyeglasses, you know, oxygen concentrators, 
expensive prescriptions. Um, mileage reimbursement, where we live, there's one doctor's office in the whole county. Um, the furthest distance and still in the county is 52 miles from the doctor's office. Um, so we help with mileage reimbursement because it costs money. Gas is expensive. We pay the Medicaid rate of 44 cents, uh, 44 cents a mile, which is the Medicaid rate set in the state of Colorado. Um, so we provide that to folks that are not Medicaid coverage and not eligible for another program, um, as would be through the senior coalition or uh, the um, other senior program we have here in Fair Play. Um, we, we had a two-prong approach to COVID-19. Um, our initial uh, attack was helping the population with the social determinants of health when the state shut down. The state shut down on March 24th of 2020. Our board of directors, um, we designed a policy whereby funding would be offered to the population through our grantors. Um, through an application process. Um, as the, it ground on, we started working with public health when they were developing vaccines and how we were gonna start administering those vaccines to this very rural population. Um, we initiated vaccine clinics at the beginning of 2021 that went straight through May. Um, this little organization, we vaccinated over, we vaccinated over 2000 people, which in a county with 17,000 people, 2,000 is not so bad. Um, and then we do the annual sports physicals for the kiddos in our community, because half the time our kids don't see doctors here. So Rocky Mountain Rural Health has approximately nine, uh, 6,000 contacts per year. Uh, 3,800 of them are unduplicated, and that's direct contact with the population. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in this picture, there's two community health workers, a board member. I don't feel the need to point them out, but I do feel the need to say that these are all our outreaches of the last couple of months. They're widely attended. They're expected. Um, when we have to cancel it, is, it's met with frowns. Um, two, there are always two community health workers on each event. Um, that is either to hold a class or to just do a, a routine informational guidance type um, outreach. We do these once a week in a, what we call our rural centers. In Park County, Colorado, there's only two towns that have are incorporated, that's Fair Play and Alma. All of the rest is un, unincorporated Park County, so we call them our rural centers. We travel to a different rural center every week with all of our wares offering education and training. Um, we, we, we got quite the little following. We have our own little groupies and it's great because they're getting routine checks. Um, we track the data on them. So, you know, if, they're, if they have blood pressure issues, we track their blood pressures. Um, they can reach out to us, get, we will send their dates, times and readings to their primary care physician so that the dog has a history and knows what's happening to them. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have 11 primary partners that we work with. Um, the Colorado Community Health Alliance is actually works directly with, um, with the Department of Human Services for the state of Colorado. They represent the Medicaid population. Here in Park County, um, we are on the lower economic spectrum. So approximately 3,600 of our residents are on Colorado Medicaid. Um, so they need that extra support and attention. Uh, we work directly with Park County Public Health, always have, always will. Uh, we work with the vaccination clinics Public health obtained the vaccines. We, we got the volunteer doctors to administer the vaccines. Um, we've been out on outreaches seriously since 2008, working together, doing uh, health screenings, stuff for the kids. Um, the Summit Foundation, 
a lot of our if you look at our um, list there, not everybody covers the whole county. So we have a hodgepodge of partners that cover different areas of our county. Uh, Summer County helps us cover Alma Fairplay. Colorado, uh, the Colorado Community Health Alliance helps us cover the whole county. And if you look at the bottom there, we have two uh, senior groups. We have the coalition and we have the alliance. Our county is so large that not one group can cover the whole thing. That's why our partners are so vital to what we do every day and how we do it. Um, next slide, please. So the Colorado Community Health Alliance uh, represents that, that Medicaid population. That Medicaid population is near and dear to my heart because they face more barriers to care um, based on their financial position. Many of them do not have reliable transportation, so they are reliant on others. Uh, most of our population, the reason they moved to Park County is because of social isolation. They chose that. They chose that for their mental health. They chose that for their desire to be out of the city. They chose it for any given reason, but they are completely socially isolated. And with the lack of reliable transportation, it throws up a whole bunch of really big barriers for them. Um, a lot of these folks have a low health literacy and need additional guidance and support and working with their primary care providers to understand what their actual health needs are. And then we figure out how to get them to those services. Um, we work with them when they end up in the hospital and or, or in a long term rehab facility and a release back into our community. Um, we have so very few resources that having an advocate teaching them how to self advocate and telling them where the services they are and getting those connections made is um, in, in some cases it's 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 life saving so i'm very proud of the work that we do with our Medicaid population here in Park county um, next slide please. So Park County government is a local government. It's actually the largest employer in, in all of Park County. We have a wonderful working relationship with many departments um, within the local government. We work with the Board of County Commissioners. We work with public health. We work with the Department of Human Services. We actually even work with the county fairgrounds. Um, so when you have a reliable partner that you know is not going anywhere, you hang on tight and you do what you can to work together. Um, throughout the pandemic, the county government supported Rocky Mountain Rural Health and its outreach to the community and helping people maintain their social determinants of health needs. Uh, they provided us with actual funding, which is not something they usually do. Um, but they did uh, make an exception in that case and told us, get your boots on the ground, kids, get out there and find out what's happening. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, we devised, again, a, a policy whereby how we reach our folks and what they qualify for and then in what form that help came. Next slide, please. I know I've addressed public health, but I just can't state it enough. Um, yesterday, just to maybe kind of paint a picture for you, yesterday, Rocky Mountain Rural Health and Park County Public Health left our offices at 8 a.m. and headed to the most distant part of our county, which is Lake George. Um, we arrived there at about 10 a.m., we held a flu vaccination clinic. It went wonderful. We had Department of Human Services. We had the Senior Coalition there. We had a great group of people. We stayed there for two hours, loaded up, and headed to Guffey, uh, which is not as far from Lake George, but way more remote. I drove some county dirt roads bouncing around for a couple hours there. I think my point is, is that we made two stops in rural Park County and spent four hours with the population 
and spent four and a half hours driving. Um, so that is that is our remoteness. That is our challenge, how far apart we are and how we get to services. Um, Department of Human Services was with us on this trip. They offered their LEAP applications, assistance signing up for Medicaid and other uh, temporary needs, uh, needs, aid to needy families and their stuff. So when you go out, you go out in a group and you grab them all up together. And it was an incredibly successful outreach. We've done this many times and we'll continue to do it to serve our population. Next slide, please. So some of our other partners, uh, the first one there is the South Park Health uh, Care. That is the one and only doctor's office. Fortunately, it is right across the street from my office because we get called in there pretty regularly. We get called in there pretty regularly to meet with patients in the clinic, inside the exam rooms to discuss needs uh, on where they need to go and how we're going to get them there. Um, it's a, it's, we, we really, I, I know I can't express this enough. We only have that one doctor's office. It has five exam rooms, a part-time doctor and a part-time nurse practitioner. That's all we have. So anything outside of the common cold, any long-term chronic illness, um, needs to be treated elsewhere. So we, we work directly with the providers, meeting the people on the ground and helping them um, get to the places they need to be. We work with the South Park Food Bank because that's where we find some of our other desperate population in providing warm clothing, jackets, hats, and, and any other thing they need. Mountain Pea Shelter, our woman's shelter or our, our domestic violence shelter, I should correct myself, um, only has a presence in Bailey, Colorado. That is 40 miles away from Fair Play. So we give them a space in our office so that they can meet the people here in Fair Play and the people in Fair Play and surrounding don't have to travel to them. So most of our partnerships are let's have a place where we can all meet. And if I have a place, you can use my place and I'll use you. And so this is how our partners work. Um, instead of requiring people to travel to us, we focus more on traveling and getting the services to them. Um, our, other, our other groups is, you know, the Senior Alliance of Community Church was an interesting one. We had worked together on some things, but during COVID, boy, our churches really stepped up their game. Um, they got a lot of money from their, you know, their head organizations were passing down money and they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to vet people. They didn't know how to, you know, create. So Rocky Mountain Rural Health did the vetting for a lot of our churches saying, yeah, this is okay, they pass. Go ahead and, and give them the funding they need. So, um, and then the local school district, again, we take, we take the education to them. Um, right here in Fair Play, we bring a testicular cancer awareness event to the young men um, in the school because they are of prime age to develop testicular cancer. We've had a couple of tragic cases here in our community. And so we bring the education to the kids. Um, next slide, please. The South Park Health Service District. So from June of 2014 to October of 2019, Park County didn't have any uh, primary care physicians. They didn't have any doctors. There was no doctor's office. There was nowhere to go. We were at that time, Rocky Mountain Rural Health was sending everybody out of the county for any service, health service that they needed, period. Um, we knew it wasn't sustainable. We were seeing incidences where people were delaying care. Um, they would be putting helicopters, flight for life to, the, to Denver because they just waited and waited. They wouldn't go to a doctor's office. So we got together with the town of Alma and the town of Fair Play and the Board of County Commissioners for Park County and said, we have to do something. We've got to get medicine back in the county. So we um, worked with an attorney and got a ballot measure put on the 2017 midterm elections. And though there were two measures, 
One was, shall the South Park Health Care Service District be created? And the second one was, if so created, shall there be a 1% sales tax on non-perishables with no sunsets? The population clearly recognized the problem because um, the first measure, 1A, passed at 74%, and 1B passed at 72%. The population recognized we needed assistance, we needed services, and, and they voted accordingly. That district has now put us in a position where we have a full-time clinic, and they are currently working on building a pharmacy here in Fairplay. So they're doing amazing work. They also support Rocky Mountain Rural Health and with funding um, so that we can work with their constituents as far as accessing additional health services, medical billing issues, and you know, applications for social security disability. Next slide, please. I don't think we can ever, ever, ever under underestimate the support that foundations do for nonprofits in rural settings. The Summit Foundation is a local foundation. It's right over the hill to the north of us. Um, and they support Rocky Mountain Rural Health and have done so for the last five years. Um, they do, they, they help us with key programs, establishing new programs. We'll be establishing a new program this year and that they're willing to support and we'll get that into the schools. Um, they're the ones that pay for the, the cancer awareness classes that we bring to the kids. I, they, they do so much for us, it is, it's amazing. Next slide, please. I know you've all heard of the Affordable Care Act, that 882 page document that allows us all to have health insurance. Um, Rocky Mountain Rural Health has had certified health coverage guides on staff since its inception. The first open enrollment period was in 2014. Park County has seen a decrease of 14% uh, in uninsured individuals in, in the community. It is taken the pressure off of our local ambulance districts. Our ambulance districts take people prior to would take people uninsured to the local hospital, which is outside the county and a 50 minute drive one way. So they, we've lost the service of that ambulance for at least an hour and a half. Um, they, saw, they saw an immediate um, impact on, commu on community members, the less demand for service and the less delinquency in bills. Uh, we get this funding through uh, Family Intercultural Resource Center, which is also not in our county. It's located in Summit County, and they do a grant every year and include us in their budget. Um, we see probably 300 people a year requesting assistance with the Affordable Care Act, um, and we will continue to keep that good work up and let them access healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's me walking the donkey. Uh, we're really big on donkeys up here in Park County. We have a big old event called Borough Days. Um, but I, this is more about all of the funders that help us with that dreaded general operating costs. Um, we can write all the programs in the world and, and offer all the programs in the world, but we got to keep the lights on. And so, again, that those foundations that are out there and our, and our donors that donate every year to us um, make the difference. Uh, give us the funding to keep all of that stuff going that we need to do. Next slide, please. Our largest funders are... Uh, the Colorado Community Health Alliance, the Summit Foundation, the Health Service District that we help create, Family Intercultural uh, Resource Center in El Pomar. These are all people that um, are pretty rock solid funders for Rocky Mountain Rural Health. They approach us regularly. Every single one of these organizations approached us during the pandemic and said, write us an email, tell us what you need, we'll make sure you have it. And that is how we made it through the pandemic. Uh, we never closed. 
and our people knew we were here and ready to help. Um, next, next slide, please. So this is Park County. This is the land that I love. I've lived here for 25 years. It is a massive county. It's larger than the state of Delaware. We only have seven people for every one square mile. So we're pretty spread out. Um, we are located, average is located at 7,000 feet above sea level, but the highest incorporated town in North America is here in Park County. It's at 10,000 feet. The reason I point out all these, you know, weather statistics and road closures and all that is because that directly impacts trans transportation. Um, it is not uncommon for me to leave work in the middle of the winter um, and have the road close and have to find out whose house I'm having to sleep over with because uh, I can't get home from where I am and I only live seven miles from Fair Play. Um, our population center, if you look in the upper right hand of that um, map there is Bailey. That is where most of our people live and that is classified in the state of Colorado as rural. Yeah, once you pass, um, once you pass that midway point, Kenosha Pass, everything after that is what is classified as frontier. So while the average is seven people per one square mile, when you get out to my neck of the woods, we're talking two people per square mile. So to say that a regional transportation authority isn't probably a really good idea is an understatement. How do we, you know, when our roads are subject to closure at any time, you see the three main thoroughfares, any of uh, the, the reds you see are paved. After that, there's nothing else paved. It's all washboard, it's all rural country road. Um, and it's, it's, it's a rough ride <laughs> from uh, A to B. Next slide, please. So that, that's washboard, in case you were curious what that meant in that picture there. That's what most of the roads look like here in Park County, dirt, rock, washboards. Um, we have the one primary care provider. We don't have any durable medical companies. We have no home health care. We have no pharmacy and everybody travels outside of the county for their services. Um, I left my home the other day at 9 a.m. for a 1030 appointment in the next county. It's an all-day excursion. When you leave the county for medical, you leave for the day and you come back at night. Um, we, we, how do we, how do we do this? What happens? Who gets there? Next slide, please. So we only have in the county um, three providers. We have a summit stage and it is it, pre-pandemic, it was two dollars a trip after since the pandemic, it's free. And that just takes people from Fair Play to Breckenridge. And that's basically a 20 mile trip over a 12,000 foot mountain pass. So it's a hairy, scary ride, but it's free and it can get you to Summit County, which actually has a hospital and they have doctors and they have specialists. So that's great. Um, then we have Busting, which is a program run by the Colorado Department of Transportation that rolls into Fair Play at about nine in the morning and it returns to Fair Play at about four o'clock in the afternoon. The problem is, is if it takes you all the way down to Denver, you have to figure out how to get your any of your doctor's appointments shopping down and back on the bus. So if it leaves at 8.55 a.m., it will bring you to Denver at 10.55 a.m. And you would have to be back at 1.50 p.m. So it's not really a usable resource as far as doctor's appointments and any of that, but it will get you to Denver. Um, the other one is MedRide. Uh, that program is wonderful. It's door-to-door -door service. It's only available to Medicaid population. Other people need rides besides our Medicaid population. 
So then what do we do? Well, we have a network of volunteers. We have the church groups that have volunteers. We have the senior coalition and the senior alliance that have volunteers. And then we put the call out to friends and neighbors. This guy's got to go. We need to get him down there. You know, he's on dialysis. We have a guy that travels uh, to Salida once a week for dialysis. We've been paying 44 cents a mile reimbursement and, until, until he gets his transplant. That's what we'll do. Um, we get that 44 cents a mile from our grantors, from our funders, from people that are willing to help us out so that we can get him to where he needs to be. Next slide, please. This is my favorite slide. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, that's what it looks like when I drive to work in January. That, um, that is a tweet from CDOT, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation, was on January 15th, which was a Friday. It tweeted out at 9.36 a.m. I was at work for an hour and a half at that point. The road was closed. I got home Sunday. That's how long it was shut down. So... Um, that happens regularly, so it's really hard for our folks to plan on where they're going, when they're going to be there, and the cancellation if they don't make it. So this is this is what we face. Our winters are very, very long. Uh, they run from October to May. It's not unusual to see snow in July, August, and September at all. I've seen snow on July 4th, and I have seen snow... Um, two days before my birthday last year, and I'm still pretty bitter about that, and I was born in September, so just saying. Um, the picture on the left is, is what the usual slide and glide looks like when you're driving home in the winter traffic. It's, there, it's, it's snow packed, it's icy, and the visible, visibility is gone. You're at 10,000 feet, and you're just trying to get by like everybody else. So, Next slide, please. This is Miss Erin. She's a 70 pound border collie mix, 70 pounds. Uh, she's buried up to her neck. That picture was taken last May, five months ago. So we, our winters go on and on and on. And we just had to share a picture of Erin because she's a very sweet girl. And she had just had to have knee surgery. So um, next slide. Well, that's the end of my presentation. I enjoyed um, having a moment to chat with you folks. Sorry if I chewed your ear off, um, but if you have any questions, this is my contact information and I'd be more than happy to answer any now. Barbie, thank you so much. Um, and Virginia as well for your presentations today. Um, Barbie, I'm really curious. Um, and as the, the person facilitating Q&A, hi everyone. I'm Megan Wolf, sorry, Senior Policy Development Manager at Trust for America's Health. I really appreciate everyone being here today and for some really interesting presentations. Barbie, what is the, um, do you have a um, number or percentage of older adults? That live in Park County because it, with the weather looking like that, I can imagine what transportation challenges, what the transportation challenges must be for older adults. So our population is aging. Our actual largest population group is our 40 to 65 set. We okay. do have a very low mortality rate because of our elevation. Most folks are required not required, but they're advised to leave the county um, because of the elevation, usually between the ages of 72 and 75. We do try to keep people in their homes as long as possible, but um, the lack of oxygen is really tough on the human body. We weren't designed to live at 10,000 feet. I'm, I'm certain of that, but it's beautiful and people don't want to leave. So we usually end up... Um, we always keep a list of assisted living facilities in our pocket for those that are told it's time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how many assisted living facilities do you have? In none. Your... Oh, none, oh, okay, wow. No, no. Wow. Uh, we, so usually it depends on um, the way Park County is situated. It is just truly in the state, middle of the state. So we have folks that, you know, some want to head towards Colorado Springs, some want to head towards Denver, some want to head towards Pueblo. So we're kind of, we have a list for every region 
um, when we, you know, when we're telling, when we're trying to guide people to the services they need. Right, um, right. So yeah, so we don't have any of those here either. <laughs> So there have been a couple of comments about the availability of telehealth services um, in, in your jurisdiction, as well as if there's no pharmacy, is there at least a mail order pharmacy available? So yeah, so um, the advent, uh, you know, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, the COVID pandemic was awful, but with that came the approval through Medicare and Medicaid to do telehealth. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, prior to COVID-19 never paid for telehealth visits. So when that happened, they started paying and that is marvelous. And that has really helped our population, except for uh, because we are so rural, most folks, uh, we don't have, um, what is it, DSL or whatever your high speed stuff is. We, uh, our internet comes in the form of short haul antenna or satellite dish, um, which is subject to corruption just because it's, you know, line of sight. It's not hardwire, hard connected, and then wireless inside the building. Mm -hmm. So we rely on a different type of internet access that we do. We have fiber optics in town, fair play. Um, but after that, outside, we're relying on short haul antenna and satellite dish for our for our internet. So it can be patchy at best. Um, as far as no pharmacy, um, when we when the health service district entered into the contract with Health One, who operates the clinic here in Fair Play, part of the deal was that they would carry emergency medications. Um, so that, well, you know, they have their crash room and their, you know, their little, you know, treatment room and all that's, you know, the nitroglycerin and all that stuff that's needed there, but they carry a small supply of antibiotics and a small supply of blood pressure meds so that when they have someone that comes in, they have an infection, they need to be treated. They can at least start that course of treatment right away instead of again, delaying care. Um, and then mail order pharmacy is, is used throughout the community. That's great, that's great. And then um, there was another question about if, if the internet service is so sketchy um, and, you know, and, and, and really not accessible for everyone, is, is there, are there health services available also by phone? Yes, they do do telehealth. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Telehealth is done more often than, um, than by video here here at the local clinic here it's more often it's by phone than it is by video because of the internet issue so right. thank you so i want to open it up to additional questions from um, anyone in our participating audience today if you'd like to ask a question simply unmute yourself um, and and please feel free to ask and we'll wait just a couple moments to see if there other there are any other questions or through the chat I'm happy to keep the conversation going, but I do want to open it up to others as well. And um, Barbie and Virginia, please feel free to ask each other questions as well. I, I know you guys know each other, so. Megan, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so Barbie, I, um, I have a deep affinity for um, relationships and partnerships with uh, churches and I was just curious how that works is there a church van I mean that's something it's interesting <clears throat> that's a model that I grew up with um, knowing that the church van would go get older adults and take them to um, events not necessarily to medical appointments but that was something that I grew up with and so I'm curious about how that how that model is working especially given the fact that you're um, so rural Actually, so the senior coalition had to give up their 14 uh, seat van a couple of years ago due to its condition and not funding to, to get it put back on the road and, you know, other issues with it. So we're basically our churches um, are it's, it's a private vehicle. We have someone with they need a ride can who who's available and it's one of those that's 
um, it's read uh, with the bulletin, at, you know, the, the bulletin at the end of church, at the at the end of the, the ceremony, you know, Rocky Mountain Rural Health called, they need a driver for these days, is anyone available, just give them a call. It, that kind of, it's just that kind of, you know, you put the call out and, and, and all of the churches are really good about relaying that message that we're looking for someone to help. That's great, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm just curious if there are other ways of, apart from vaccines, and, and I may have missed it, but um, for either Virginia or Barbie, um, apart from vaccines, what are some other ways that, um, that either AAAs or the you know, community-based healthcare organizations can partner with public health departments? So we work with, so, you know, we're, we're community health workers, we're lay health workers, we're not, you know, RNs or anything like that. Um, so public health share, working together, public health has access to vital information um, that lay people can, like we use a lot of public health for um, vaccination information. Uh, who's vaccinated and what you need for vaccinations and where you're due. And so a lot of that, the information that public health has being shared in the community, you know, not like, oh, Joe Blow doesn't have his MMR or anything like that, but who's lacking, where it's slow, getting in the schools. The schools were really, really, um, they were down to at one point, 33% vaccination rate uh, amongst new um, kindergartners coming in and they were just at their wit's end. They're like, how do we get these people to get their kids vaccinated? This is not okay. And Colorado has a blanket waiver. You can just sign, I don't want to vaccinate it and it's over. And without understanding the ramifications of not being vaccinated. And so they reached out to public health and public health is like, we're outreaching, we're outreaching. And they reached out to us. And I think this was our initial contact with public health, it was like, what do we do? Well, we got the invisible threat and we just screened it and screened it and screened it until we made people crazy with it. And vaccinations slowly came up and now public health comes to our sports physical event and we give them the list of the kids we're screening for a sports physical. They run them through the Colorado, the CIS system, Colorado Immunization Information System, and they write down all the vaccines they need. So when the event comes, I'm able to hand the list of vaccines to the parents saying, your kiddo really should get these vaccinations. It's important. So all those little puzzle pieces fit together, and hopefully we get more and more vaccinated, just general vaccinations, not the flu or the COVID or any of that stuff. Right, right, thank you. And I would uh, just add that um, area agencies on aging are involved in home and community-based services. And probably there are a lot of clients that the AAA and the public health organization share. Um, and I think that the, the issues of access, housing issues, um, you know, um, other kinds of, of personal issues that public health agencies become aware of. I think a referral relationship between area agencies on aging and, and public health is really, really important. Um, but I would also say there are opportunities to partner on things like, you know, Barbie was talking about other kinds of vaccines. I think one of the things that COVID uh, has shown us is there are different models for getting to people and getting health care to people. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be people coming to a clinic. Um, sometimes the the mobile uh, units that went out, not just in rural areas, but also in many urban areas to actually near people's homes or other kinds of locations like senior centers or nutrition sites where healthcare can be much more accessible. And not only that, it can encourage people who are not necessarily um, um, enthusiastic 
about going in uh, to see to see a doctor or to see a nurse. So I think that there are lots and lots of ways uh, that public health and um, and triple A's can work together. I would say mental health issues are mm -hmm. another critical thing. I mean, I think we've all become aware that mental health issues um, affecting the entire population, you know, have really kind of uh, come to the fore um, during the COVID um, crisis. But I, I think that with older adults, where there's a lot of isolation, where people cannot get from their homes, um, they're bedridden or they're housebound, um, that ways of reaching out to folks like that um, and finding creative ways to do it, um, I, I think are really important. And I think uh, probably uh, there are, I know that there are lots of examples around the country where public health and area agencies on aging have worked together to create evidence-based programs, uh, to offer fall prevention, things of that sort that can hugely make a difference and enable people to stay in their homes for a longer period. Absolutely. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, Barbie. Thank you both for being here with some great information. Once again, uh, um, a really uh, jam-packed um, monthly training for our age-friendly public health systems project initiative movement. Uh, we're not sure what we're going to call ourselves right now, but appreciate you all being here. We've run out of time. Hope that you will join us next month, the third Thursday in November. We, we will have um, our partners at, the, uh, at ASTA, the Association for State and Territorial Health Officials, who will be sharing some new programming and resources for uh, for public health and at the state and local level. So thank you all for joining us and hope to see you next month. And to close this out, for those of you that are viewing this training as a recording, again, this is for people viewing this training after it has already occurred live, the following link can be used to document that you've attended this training. Um, it is the link at the bottom of this slide, and you can fill out the form there to indicate that you have viewed this training to indicate um, you are interested in also pursuing the champion designation, and this will be in count as one of the six trainings. And we will close out with our website. Thank you all for attending today. Thanks, everyone.